morning to you. So in, uh, most of you guys know, you know, I spent a lot of years doing uh, student ministry and um, before uh, becoming the pastor here at Expo, but in, in all of our years of, of serving in student ministry, we uh, have taken students on a lot of trips to a lot of different places and fun adventures, and we've been to a lot of camps and uh, things like that in the summertime. Uh, and it seems like every camp that we go to uh, uh, or have gone to, the, one of the activities at the camp is always um, is zip lining. You guys know what I'm talking about? You know, like they uh, you, they they strap you into this thing and and and, and, it, and you, you slide down this 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 wire thing there. Now, some of you guys might not know this about me, but I am afraid of heights. Mm. I don't like them at all. Uh, I'm okay. Like I can be in an elevator. I can be in a tall building on a high bridge, things like that, if I'm secure. But you put me on like a platform and you've got nothing uh, uh, holding me up other than this small, tiny little wire and a little hook. Uh, that I can buy at Home Depot. I'm a little scared, uh, and, and, and so I'm, I'm not. I'm not crazy with this. I, I I don't like don't like heights, and so I don't understand why people think that zip lining is fun. It doesn't make sense to me. But nonetheless, I've gone zip lining several times over the years. You you, you climb if you've never been. You, you, you climb up this this uh, this to this platform. Sometimes they have a, a staircase for you to walk up to the platform. Uh, I've been to some camps where it was literally like a ladder uh, that you got to climb up and, and get up in, into the air on this type of thing. And, and that was always sketchy to me. But anyway, you, you get to the top of this platform. They, they strap you into this harness and then they attach this harness to this tiny little wire that is supposed to support your weight. And for me, that's a lot. Uh, and, and, and then they, 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 they expect you just to throw yourself off of the edge of this platform and expect this wire to hold you up and, and that you're going to fly down this, this line uh, here. So your life is literally hanging by a thread. I don't understand why they call this fun. After they hook you up, on these things, if you've ever been, after they hook you up on these things, that's probably the worst part. Because you're hooked up, you're standing, you're, you're waiting for your, your turn to go, and you're just looking down at the ground, hundreds of feet down and down to the ground, and every worst scenario is running through my mind uh, uh, on what could happen if this thing fails, if that doesn't work, and, and, and all of this. And then the worker guy, he's like, go. Now, <laughs> For some of our teenagers, you know, those who don't value their lives at all, or maybe those who haven't learned the law of gravity yet in science class, you know, they'll just walk right off the platform, and they're like, woo, you know, and they just go after it. Some will jump off, some walk off, some will actually go off, and then they turn upside down, and they hang upside down as they're flying down this this uh, thin thread and all this, and, 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 and it, but I'm, that's not me. I'm standing on the platform, and the guy's like, go, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this now. And I'm the type of guy, like, I'm pulling on the wire, like, is this thing really going to hold me, you know? Oftentimes, what ends up happening for me, I will sit on the edge of the platform because for whatever reason, I feel a little bit safer if I sit and just roll off over the edge rather than if I just step off. I don't know why, but I just kind of feel that way. And, and I told you, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really afraid of heights in this, okay? And so finally, when I, when I do take the leap, though, and, and sometimes it's the worker giving me a little nudge uh, and pushing me off the, le the ledge there. When I finally do take that leap, when I finally do go over the edge, it's a lot of fun. It really is. Once I know things are pretty secure, it's fun to go zip lining down. If you're in the woods or you're up in the mountains, whatever, you, you get to see the, the, all the beauty that surrounds you. You're seeing it in a different perspective, and, and you get to go on this ride all the way down. It's actually kind of fun when you do that, if you can get off of the edge. Hey, listen. Sometimes life with God is a lot like zip lining. Some, sometimes I, I feel like life is, is like we're just hanging from a very tiny wire of faith, if you will. We're, we're all hooked up. We're, we're all attached in, in all of the safety procedures. But, but it's in one of those seasons of waiting where you're on that platform of life, if you will. And you just start overthinking every scenario possible with life. And you think about every 
worst case scenario and what could happen in your life, right? This, this is what happens. Now, some Christians, man, they, they don't have trouble with their faith. They, they, they could just take those leaps of faith into the unknown and they're very carefree. Some of them, maybe they'll do it even upside down and, and they just simply enjoy the ride of life and they just go with it. But then there are some Christians that are like me. <laughs> There's some Christians that are like me. We, we struggle sometimes to take that leap of faith. We, we struggle to think that we're going to be safe from any harm. And, and, and no matter how many times, uh, you know, we've done it, no matter how many times we've watched other people do it safely, for us, it just seems a little bit more scary and we struggle to do it. We struggle oftentimes to put our faith into action. We struggle at times to take a leap of faith. Now, as we've been journeying through the book of Ruth over the last Several weeks. We we've seen how how you know uh, she's she's been dedicated. This 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 girl Ruth. She's been dedicated to Naomi the, from the very beginning. Her mother in law. She she even when they were in despair and times were were tough. Uh, Ruth stayed dedicated to Naomi. We've seen Ruth now as she's been gleaning in this guy named Boaz's field, and she's been able to provide food for her and Naomi. But here's the thing: their future is still hanging in the balance. They're, they're getting food in this, and, and we saw at the end of chapter number two last week that, that Ruth gleaned in the fields uh, until the end of the barley and the wheat harvest. But that was about seven to eight weeks span of time that, they, that she was working. Once harvest season was over, they didn't know what they were going to do. I mean, they were going to have a pretty good stock of food to be able to survive for a while, but, but what were they going to do? Their life was still in balance. The, the, the re relationship with, with Ruth and Boaz that we saw at the beginning of chapter number two has, has really kind of gone stagnant. It's kind of gone, gone cold after that first date when they had lunch together and, and those things. And so, at least in Scripture, there's nothing told to us about it. We don't see any kind of, uh, of relationship that's growing from that moment that they had lunch together. There's, there's nothing happening uh, here at all. So what happens here in chapter number three, what we're going to see today, is that Naomi decides to take matters into her own hands. Today we're going to look at chapter number three. We're, we're going to learn how we can take hold of the opportunities that God gives us. We're, we're, we're going to see what it takes to put our faith into action. What is going to happen for us to grow and deepen our relationship with God? We're going to see what, what's going to happen with this. Now, listen, this, this plan that we're going to look at that Naomi cooks up for, for Ruth, it is crazy. It is, it is a crazy, crazy plan. But Ruth follows through with it. Ruth takes this leap of faith and puts herself out there. I want you to see what happens here. Look with me in, in Ruth chapter number three. I'm going to read the entire chapter to you. Uh, uh, here at first, and then we'll kind of break it down like we've been doing over the last several weeks here. So, so look at this with me. Verse 1 it says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with, with whose young woman you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she, talking about Ruth, replied, all that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over. Behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow, fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. 
lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it out, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So here's what's happened. So again, Naomi is now thinking future. What are we going to do? Our life's still kind of in the balance. We don't have any, any plans after this, this harvest season. What are we going to do? Why isn't this guy Boaz? Why is he not stepped up to the plate yet? Let's take matters in our own hands. So he tells Ruth, or she tells Ruth, she says, look, I want you to go tonight. So let me give you some backstory. So, so what would happen is in these barley harvests, they'd get all this grain together, right? But they were fearful of people who would come and rob these fields. Remember, they were outside the city. So they were fearful that people would come and rob them of their grain at nighttime. And so Boaz, the owners of the fields, it was typical for them to go and to guard their harvest. So they would sleep next to the grain that they had until they could get it all to where it needed to go. So that's that's the situation here. So this is what she tells Naomi tells Ruth. Look, when he goes after he's had his his, his night, you know, he's, he's ate and he's drank, all that. She said, then you, I like the fact that the scripture says, wait until he's ate, you know, like. They know the way to a man's heart, right? Uh, uh, make sure he's fed first. We don't want any hangry uh, men in the room, right? So anyway, but but she's like, after he's already ate and drank and all these things, when he goes and lays down, make sure you know where he's laying down. And then I want you to go to the man and uncover his feet. You're like, what in the world? Like, that, that makes no sense, right? That's like a bold move. That's like a, a proposal for a woman to, to uncover the man's feet. So what happens, she does that, she lays down next to him, he wakes up in the middle of the night, it's a bit dark, he doesn't know what's going on, and he's like, whoa, there's somebody here. And so she's like, it's Ruth, your servant. And she basically proposes to him, she's like, make your redeemer. She's like, I want you to marry me. And so Boaz here, he's like, well, I'm not quite sure. You know? <laughs> now, keep in mind, this is awkward, right? This is not common for women to propose to men. Right? That's just not, it's not even common in our day and age. But here in, in this in this story, it's even more uncommon for this to happen. And so she does it, she she makes this bold move, puts it out there, and then he's like, well, I'm not sure. You know, it's not that he said, I'm not sure, but he's like, hey, uh, I, I can't answer you directly yet. The reason is because there's another redeemer who is actually closer in kinsmanship to Naomi and Ruth than Boaz was. So, so the proper thing to do was to make sure that that closest redeemer, kinsman redeemer, to make sure that they were not interested in taking up the redeemer role. And, and he says, if he is, then that's great. But if not, he's like, hey, look, I'll take care of you. I will. And so he kind of leaves her in limbo here. So that's the story. That's what's going on. Let's break this down for a minute here and, and see what this what this does for us, okay? So, so steps we must take to deepen our relationship with God. First thing I want to point out is this. Never underestimate the power of good influences in your life. Never underestimate the power of this. I, I really do love how Naomi's attitude has changed in this whole scenario. Ever since she met Ruth and, and, and or Ruth met Boaz, her, her, her life has changed. She, she went from being this, this bitter old woman. If you remember this, she went from being this bitter old woman, only concerned about her situation and, 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 and how she was, to now she's thinking about Ruth's future. She's thinking about Ruth's well-being. That's what we see in those, those first verses there, that she's, she's saying, hey, we, we got to get you taken care of. In here, and so this is what's hatching this plan. So Naomi, she she's not been satisfied with Boaz. She's not satisfied with him dragging his feet. She doesn't understand why all of this, uh, why he hasn't uh, moved with this now. And, and and you know, bear with me because again, my imagination runs, and I'm going to blame my wife for taking me to meet chick works, right? Uh, and so I, I got this scenario in my mind that probably every day when Ruth comes home. Naomi is probably ready. She's probably got the coffee or the tea sitting across the table. And she's like, sit down. Tell me about your day. What did Boaz do? What did he look like today? How, what was he wearing? You know, did he talk to you? What did he say? Did he flirt with you? Does he talk to other girls? You know, and, and I mean, she wants all the tea in the situation, right? She's like, just give me all of it. Let me know what's going on. And again, we don't have scriptures that doesn't tell us that anything's happening. So I can imagine Naomi's like, oh, 
what is wrong with this guy? Like, he's a beautiful woman. He's a bachelor. Let's like go, you know, and, and all this. And, and, and so so all of this is going on. And so Naomi is, at this point, I guess she's at her breaking point. I don't know. She's like, all right, we got to figure this out on our own. You know, leaving us women. We got to take care of the men, you know, and, and let's do this. Same old, same old. <laughs> yeah. So Naomi hatches this crazy plan. This crazy plan for Ruth to go and ask Boaz to marry her. Again, that's a crazy thing. But man, thank God for good influences. Thank God for, for, for people who will push you to do something crazy at times, to deepen your relationship with God in here. This is what a good influence is for. Now, you know, at the end of our passage, we don't have an answer, right? We don't know if that Boaz is going to take care of her or not because of this other uh, situation that's going on here. But either way, at this point, Ruth's going to be taken care of, whether it's by Boaz or whether it's by the other redeemer. She's going to be taken care of now because of Naomi's plan, because Naomi pushed her to deepen this relationship. He, she pushed her to, 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 to get out of her comfort zone, if you will, to, uh, um, to, to deepen that relationship there. And listen, this is what good friends will do. This is what good influences will do in your life. They're going to push you to be better. They're, they're going to look out for your well-being, and they're going to try to make sure that you're taken care of. There's, there's a popular phrase that's used out there that says, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Have you heard this phrase? Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. The, the reason that this, this statement is out there is because, man, if you get around the wrong influences, then your life can go very wrong very easily, being around the wrong influences. But the opposite is very true as well. If you get around good influences, you get around the right influences, then, man, your life can go in the right direction very easier. So Naomi's influence in Ruth's life, this is in stark contrast to what we see in other parts of Scripture. There's a passage of Scripture in, uh, in, in 2 Samuel where, where King David's son gets himself into a lot of trouble. His name is Amnon. It's, it's, a, it's a very tragic story, this, this story that we see in 2 Samuel chapter 13, uh, where um, Amnon is, is, is he's having these impure thoughts about his, his half-sister, Tamar. He's having these impure thoughts about her. And, and, and the whole situation got worse because of a bad influence in Amnon's life. It actually says in 2 Samuel chapter 13 and verse number 3, it says this, but Amnon had a friend. And what happens in this situation, in this story, as it continues there in 2 Samuel 13, is that this friend convinces Amnon to set up a situation where he would be completely alone with his half-sister so that he could take advantage of her. And that's what happens. Amnon gets himself alone with his sister uh, Tamar, and he sexually assaults uh, his half-sister which ultimately led to Amnon being killed by his, his brother, Tamar's brother, his half-brother, uh, out of anger for what he did in raping his half-sister, all because Amnon had a friend, had a bad influence in his life. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You see, a true friend's going to push you to be better. A true friend is going to push you to, to grow in your relationship with God. A true friend is going to call you out if you're in sin. They're not going to push you towards sin. They're going to call you out in it. Listen, I, I've said this before. A true friend will nudge you, but they will never judge you. A true friend is going to be that one that's going to nudge you. They're going to, they're going to nudge you to go off the ledge. They're going to nudge you to take that leap of faith. They're going to nudge you if you're in sin, if you're doing something that's not right. They're going to call you out on that. They're not going to judge you and look down upon you on it, but they're going to push you to be better. These are the influences that we need in our life. If we want to deepen our relationship with God, we've got to get around good influences. Good people in our lives. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, it says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Be careful who you surround yourself with. And be thankful for those godly influence in your, influences in your life, those that are going to push you to be better. The second thing that's needed to deepen our relationship with God is to be bold in our requests to God. To be bold in our requests. As we mentioned earlier, this, man, this was a bold move on Bruce Park. This was a very bold move for her to, to go and do this. But as bold as it was, it was a move that she could make. She was able to make this move. She just had to prepare herself for it. 
She had to prepare herself for this. I want you to notice how she, how she prepared herself for this. If you look here in Scripture, verse number three, it says, Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. Okay? But we see three things right here. This is how she prepared herself. First of all, she washed herself. She washed herself. Now, look, we shower all the time, right? We often shower all the time. I hope you shower all the time uh, uh, in there. Sometimes we'll shower multiple times in a day. I don't know about you guys, but I'm one of those people. I will oftentimes shower multiple times in the day. We do that. Why? Because access to water for us is just natural, right? We don't, we don't have those concerns because we live in a great country where we have that access in there. and We waste a lot of water and those types of things. But back in these days, the plumbing wasn't the same. The situation wasn't there. And so, so it, it was a dusty and a dirty place where they lived, dirt roads, dirt floors, those types of things. And, and, and so they would often get very dirty. But because access to water wasn't very frequent, the washing wasn't as frequent either uh, in there. Now, the law of Moses, the law of Moses would require people to get cleaned up for some special event. That, that was part of the law there. But normal everyday washings weren't really a thing, if you will. So here in this passage, Naomi was telling Ruth to act like a bride who's getting ready for a wedding. This is a special event for her. So she says, I want you to go and I want you to wash yourself. This is a beautiful picture of Christ's relationship with the church. In, in charging husbands to love their wives like Christ loves the church, I want you to see what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 26, 27, he said that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. And look, I believe as a, as a Christian, even though that I have been sanctified and I've been cleansed by Christ's blood uh, on the cross, because I've been washed in the blood, as the old uh, hymn says, uh, uh, in that, I, I, even though I've been that, I do believe that as I dirty myself from sin and from the wrongdoings and things that I do in my life, that I do need to cleanse myself. I need to be able to present myself to God and to seek his face for something in my life. I believe that's true. I believe it's something we need to do. 2 Corinthians 7, verse number 1, it says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. She washed herself. She prepared herself for this bold move by washing herself, cleansing herself. Let her be, she anointed herself. She washed herself, but then she anointed herself. Now, in, in Eastern culture, fragrant oils those, those were used to protect and to heal bodies and, and to make themselves pleasant to others. Again, that, it's not as common as it is today, right? We, we shower, then we put on our body lotions or our deodorants and our body sprays. We do that, but it wasn't as common back then. But they would use these fragrances to, to make themselves pleasant to others for special occasions. A, a bride would especially take care to, to, to wear some kind of fragrant perfume that would make her desirable to be near back in these days. So, so, so again, it wasn't a, a, a common thing then. So when she tells her, wash yourself and anoint yourself, this is what's happening. And I want you to see that an, an anointing oil in, is very representative of, of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. It's very representative of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And as believers, every one of us has been anointed by the Spirit. So now we, we, we are a, a fragrance of Christ. We're a fragrance of Christ to, to God. First John chapter 2, verse number 20, it says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. She anointed herself. She washed herself. The third thing, she changed herself. Naomi told her to change her clothes. She wanted her to get out of those work clothes uh, that, that she would have been wearing from gleaning in the field. She wanted her to get out of the work clothes and put on the wedding clothes, if you will. And listen, I want you to understand that we can come to Jesus just as we are, but he refuses to leave us that way. We can come to him just as we are, but he, he wants us 
to change. He wants us to change ourselves. He wants to make us more attractive. He wants us to get out of the grave clothes and put on the grace clothes of salvation. This is what he wants us to do. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10, beautiful passage of scripture says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is what God wants to do in your life. He'll take you just as you are, but man, he wants you to change. He wants you to put on those beautiful clothes of righteousness and holiness, and he wants you to wear that and, 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 and adorn yourself as those things are. And these are the ways that Ruth prepared herself. She washed herself, she anointed herself, and she changed her clothes in there. And this prepared her to make that bold request to her Redeemer, to Boaz. And these are the steps that we get to take as we make bold requests to our God. We wash ourselves in the blood of Jesus. We ask forgiveness for our sins. We anoint ourselves with the anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes unto our lives through salvation. And we change ourselves in the way that we live our lives. This is what God desires. And, and, and before I move on here, I want to make an assumption here in Scripture. And again, this is my assumption, okay? So it's not Scripture. We don't have anything to, uh, in it. But, 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 man, I really think that, that, one, I think the assumption is, is probably pretty correct. But, but I think it's a, it presents to us a, an even better picture of our relationship with God, should the assumption be true. I'm going to assume that Ruth's best clothes that she changed into were probably not all that great. Because, again, think about it. They, 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 they were just widow women. They, they, they were very poor. That's why she was out gleaning in the field. I, I don't imagine that they had a lot of money, so they probably didn't have the best of clothes and the best of things. And so, so my mind assumes this idea that, that, that when Ruth changed into her good clothes, that they were probably not really new, and they probably were not in perfect condition. So think about this for a minute. God is not looking for us to be perfect when we come to him. He's not looking for us to have, all, have it all together and to have life put together before we can approach him. We can come to God with the best that we have. We can come to God with what we've got and we can approach him and be bold with him because he's not really concerned with the presentation as much as he is the heart of the presenter. That's what he's really concerned about. We get to do this. We get to be bold. And our request to God. That's how we can deepen our relationship with God. The one last thing to deepen our relationship is this. We need to be patient in our season of waiting. Be patient in our season of waiting. Boaz didn't give her that answer right away. Which again, kind of awkward with a proposal, you know. Uh, you kind of are expecting a, an answer at that moment, right? But Boaz did promise that he would take care of her. He promised that she would be taken care of. It just needed to be done properly. It just needed to be done in the right way. There, there was actually this kinsman redeemer that was closer to them. And so the proper thing to do was for Boaz to go and check with that guy and to make sure that he wasn't interested first before he stepped in. He wanted to make sure that it was done right. But since Naomi and Ruth believed that Boaz would accomplish what he said he would do, they waited patiently until they received a good news. They waited for it. They trusted that Boaz was going to do what he was going to do. Naomi even says he's probably not even going to sleep until he gets the matter settled. They trusted the Redeemer. They trusted in Boaz and what he would do. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 10, 11, and 12 says, For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness and to have the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Sometimes God puts us in a season of waiting. And it's not that he doesn't want to take care of us. He does, but he wants to make sure that it's done the right way. He wants to make sure that all the pieces of the puzzle have been put together first. And God will often ask us to wait. But waiting is one of the toughest things in life. 
Because we're standing on the platform and we're looking around and we start overthinking and we start thinking of all the worst scenarios that could possibly happen. We keep wondering if, if the Redeemer is going to come through, if it's going to happen, and it's definitely a tough thing to do, right? Just think, how hard is it to wait when we're waiting for food at a restaurant? <laughs> but sometimes God asks us to wait. He asks us to wait for him. Because it's in the waiting when God is working. It's in the waiting that God is working. Boaz was busy working for Ruth, and Naomi was confident that he wasn't going to rest until he had the matter settled. Now, I want you to remember this. When you're in seasons of waiting in your life, remember this verse right here, Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. It says, and I am sure of this. I'm sure of it. I'm confident. I will bank on this right here. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. I want you to know today, your Redeemer is not going to stop working for you. He will not rest until he knows you're taken care of. He's just asking you to wait as he puts all the pieces together for the plan. He's just asking you to wait. I told you earlier about how scary zip lining is for me, right? I talked about how I struggle sometimes in that waiting period and overthinking all of those things. I struggle just to, to let go and to step off of that platform and, 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 and take that, that ride. But, but, but once I do, man, I get to enjoy the ride. I get to see all of the beauty that surrounds me. I get to see it from a different perspective, and it's just a lot of fun. And, and, and here's what I've noticed in those times. Once I've taken that leap of faith and I've gone down that zip line, it's easier for me to do it the second time. Because now I've seen it at work. Now I've seen the plan put in place. And I've seen how safe that it can actually be. And so it's easier for me to go and do it a second time. It's easier for me to go and do it a third time. And the kids ask me to do it a fourth time. I'm like, no, I'm tired. I'm going to go get a nap. <laughs> but it's easier, right? Faith works in the same way. The, the, the more we exercise faith, the more we take that leap of faith, the easier it actually gets to step off the platform, to take the leap. I love what Warren Wiersbe, he's a, 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 a writer, a commentary, he writes books on, on all, uh, he writes books on books of the Bible and things like that, uh, but Warren Wiersbe, he said this in his, his commentary on the book of Ruth. This is what he said. He said, like Ruth, we must not be satisfied merely with living on leftovers or even receiving gifts. We must want him alone. For when we have him we also have all that he owns. It's not the gifts that we seek, but the giver. You see, Ruth and Naomi, they weren't satisfied just getting the food. They weren't just satisfied with getting, you know, uh, uh, Naomi wasn't just satisfied with Ruth bringing those leftover foods home that we brought from last time, right, that we talked about last time. They, they wasn't that. They wanted the Redeemer. That's where the true security was going to come from. It wasn't just from the blessings that we can get, but it was having the Redeemer. And that's what we should desire in our lives. Not just the blessings of God. Man, we want God with us. We want to be in a close relationship with our Redeemer. And if you want a deeper relationship with God, go get it. Take the step. Take the leap of faith. Be bold about it. And listen, I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy the ride. God, we love you. God, we thank you for such a beautiful picture of our relationship that we get to have with you through Ruth and Boaz. God, I thank you so much that sometimes we, we got to take that leap of faith. And Lord, I'm, I'm so thankful for those influences in my life, those, those people that, that, that push me to be better, the people that, 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 that will nudge me, but they will never judge me. I, I'm so thankful for those people that sharpen me in my life. Lord, I'm thankful that I'm able to be bold in my request to you. God, I can ask you anything. I can cry out to you, Abba, Father. Lord, I thank you for that privilege that I can do that. And God, I thank you for the assurance that I have in my seasons of waiting. That I can trust and I can know that you are not going to rest until you have put all the pieces of the puzzle together for the perfect plan for my life. 
And I thank you that it's in the waiting that you are working. And God, I'm praying that you would just help me. I'm praying that you would help every single person under the sound of my voice. I'm praying that you would help us as a church, as exponential church, Lord, to take the leap of faith, to go deeper in our relationship with you, to draw closer to you in all that we do. We give you all the honor and glory and the praise for it. In your name we pray. Amen.